What's up, everybody? It's the Super Sleuth here coming at you with some exciting news. Get this. Coltish has our very own YouTube channel. It's been in the works for a while, but now it is here and we want you to be a part of it. You can go to coltishtv.com where you'll be redirected to our YouTube channel page. You can subscribe and hit the bell to get notifications. Not only are we going to be releasing shorts and special clips from previous episodes, but we have special content that we are going to be creating specifically for this channel. So be there. Don't be square. We don't want you to miss out. Go to coltishtv.com. Get redirected to our YouTube channel today. Subscribe and hit the bell. See you there, guys. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Coltish. It's a little different again this time. Right now, I'm flying solo, but I have my buddy here. His name is Ryan McMartin, and we're doing an episode today on Lori Vallow and the Mormon doomsday cult. I know that we've had many people ask us to do this and we're doing it. We're going to get oh, into yeah. it. And I know Ryan's a new face, but <laughs> what's interesting about Ryan and I is actually on the side, uh, hopefully for Apologia Studios, all access yeah. members, we're going to be having a full Mormon history podcast. We're about 19 episodes in already. Yeah. We're, we're, we're at MCU levels yeah. at the moment of how much material we've produced. Yeah. And we, we we're, we're what? Like, eight years into Mormon history out of like 180. That's the funny thing about (laughs) Mormonism is the history is absolutely insane. We're 19 episodes in, which is it's roughly around probably 35 hours. It's not available yet, but we're also doing another series uh, for under the banner of heaven. And that's kind of where our Mormon history series began. It just, all of a sudden we planned on doing like 10 episodes and it turned into way more. So we just have a minimum of self-control. We have a minimum of self-control, but I'm, he he texted me last night and said, we're doing two episodes and that's it. Yeah. You know, just two hours and, and I'm cutting you off. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Like, so, all right. All right. Fine. I'm happy to introduce you guys to Ryan and hopefully you'll be seeing more of his face yeah. in the future. So keep your eye out for Apologia Studios, all access, become a member. And in the distant or short future, you will see all of our episodes on yeah. Mormon history and under the banner of heaven there. So let's let's get into it, Ryan. Uh, let's talk about Lori Vallow and the Mormon doomsday cult. Where do we begin? Do yeah. we begin in 1960? <laughs> That's a, that's always the tricky part whenever you're talking about any, any story whatsoever. Just where do we even begin with this? Um, and that was, uh, that was kind of the problem that we had with Under the Banner of Heaven because we were like, well, where do we start? I guess at the beginning. Well, where's the beginning? Uh, you know, Joseph Smith's grandparents. Okay, yeah, well, I guess that's it. And, and look what happened with that. Yeah, we obviously went all the way back to Adam anyway. So yeah, 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 right. <laughs> uh, so with uh with this there are a couple of preliminaries we want to make something clear from the outset the the cult that Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell participated in is not to be conflated with mainstream mormonism they're not representative of it and as we go on we're going to talk about uh, a couple of specific really important points where they deviate from i guess we can call it mormon orthodoxy you know, and so so we want to make that clear, and we're gonna keep on kind of revisiting that idea just to make sure everyone is uh, on the same page. Yeah, well, hold on. Before we go further, then we have the wild, wild world of Mormon orthodoxy, the, <laughs> the ever changing, ever vescent, uh, bubbly world. Yeah, what even is that? Yeah, of uh, continuing revelation. Yeah. But uh, one of our slogans is "Bad theology hurts yes. people." So, can you briefly describe why Mormonism, in terms of bad theology, can give birth to a movement like this? Yeah, uh, I think I think we can kind of introduce that now. But uh, it, the the way that I think of it is that um, if Chad and Lori had not, or if they had been uh, just regular mainstream Mormons, then at the very least, this situation would have played out very differently. However, the the context, uh, both doctrinally and culturally, of Mormonism did kind of shape things in a way. So obviously, like your average Mormon neighbor or, you know, the the guys that come and knock on your door, they're going to decry everything that Chad and Lori ever did. And they're going to be right to do that because that's not a part of their religion. But there are going to be those, those things that, uh, that Chad and Lori will do that will not make sense 
unless you understand some specific aspect of Mormonism, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. One, one thought for me is kind of like the burning in the bosom. And we have a, yeah. many conversations with people on Thursday nights doing evangelism, Ryan, and oh, it's yeah. like God speaks to them. So yeah. it seems like Mormonism with continuing revelation and a priesthood authority yeah. uh, creates the perfect storm environment for people when they go off the loose end or easily go off the yeah. loose end and just do their own thing. Yeah. And one of the weird things uh, that we're going to see about this particular cult is that it isn't a fundamentalist cult. And in, and the way that this works is that basically with any organized religion, you're going to have three potential sources of authority. You're going to have uh, divine uh, external revelation, like a Bible or, um, you know, the Quran or something like that. Right. And then you're going to have teachers, you know, uh, maybe they're going to be Bible teachers, pastors, sheikhs, rabbis, whatever. And then finally you have the, the boots on the ground, the, the average, the average show, you know, your, your average, uh, Orthodox Jewish person or something like that. Right fundamentalism in any religion is going to be the idea that that first type, that revelation, the the prophets, the scripture, that that is meant to be the foundation for everything else that you believe in, everything that you do. Nobody's really consistent with that. You know, you find a lot of fundamentalists that are like, you're, you're ignoring this part right here, you know, but um, that's what fundamentalism basically is. And so in Mormonism, fundamentalism usually takes the form of, uh, you know, ignoring, like they'll say the, the church has apostatized. They'll say um, basically everybody after a certain point, every prophet has gone off the deep end and we reject everything. And so they're usually going to be embracing the policies of, say, Brigham Young. And so you're going to have things like polygamy. You're going to have blood atonement. You're going to have uh, even just the way that they dress, right? This group, though, isn't fundamentalist they are still follow in that line of uh, you being the arbiter of truth, right? And that's, that's what theological liberalism is, where you are the one who determines by some kind of experience or wisdom or whatever what ultimate reality is. And, and this happens a lot. Uh, this happens, unfortunately, in a lot of uh, liberal Christianity. You know, we don't... Um, yeah, we see that bleeding in, in even into the Mormon uh, organization right now because yeah. uh, uh, Elder, I think it's Elder Alan D. Haynes, he just said in one of his speeches, he said, you cannot treat prophecy like antique cars. It doesn't get yeah. more value in age. And you can't use past prophecy to, to uh, contradict future prophecy. Meaning that right. Mormon fundamentalism is ultimately unfundamentalistic. Because yeah. there's no solid or concrete ground for someone to appeal yeah. to other than the authority of the prophet who's speaking now. Yeah, and there's, um, I think f for the thinking Mormon, you have to embrace some sort of theological liberalism here because, uh, like, how do you intellectually defend the book of Abraham? You really can't. Um, we've got an extensive uh, series that's going to come out at some point in the future where we talk about that. Um, and, and so like, what do you do with it? Well, what you have to do is in some way uh, embrace some sort of contradiction or just say, uh, well, I, I don't believe this or, uh, you know, I believe this in spite of the evidence or something like that. You have to go to some sort of, I feel right about it when we, we shouldn't have to do that. You know, we shouldn't have to uh, embrace that kind of uh, an ideology in order to continue believing things. We should be able to, uh, to embrace the truth and also be able to defend it intellectually and personally. So. I mean, and that's, and that's the truth of what's going on in this situation with bad theology hurting people. Uh, doing what you think or feel is right in the situation yeah. uh, for Lori Vallow or whatever last name you want to give her yeah. and Chad Daybell. It ended There's a up, lot of those. <laughs> it ended up with murder, yeah. conspiracy and murder. Yeah. Uh, the fruit of their labor was that. It was yeah. all in vain and there will be justice that will occur right. Uh, within this life, but also ultimate justice given yeah. by God for the murder that 
uh, she committed on uh, her son mm-hmm. and uh, her daughter yeah. ultimately. So let's and let, a variety of other people and a, yeah, even yeah. her uh, yeah one of her ex husbands and even maybe her husband before that and Possibly. Chad's wife. Well, yeah, let's yeah. let yeah, let's, yeah, yeah, it's let's a start. whole whole big thing. I think yeah. we started a good little foundation though, just to get yeah. the our audience thinking about how Mormonism can give birth to a movement such as this. Yeah, in the beginning, um, there was a little family, Barry and Janice Cox, and they were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of, LD, of, of Latter-day Saints. And these are often portrayed as being just typical members. But I don't think that's 100% true. I mean, there's nothing really about them that would make everyone say these people are freaks or, uh, you know, their children are, are bound to go off and commit murder and start a cult or anything. But they were a little bit odd. Um, for one thing, Barry was known as one of those people that really only wanted to talk about one thing. Mm. And in his case, that was taxes. He only ever wanted to talk about how taxes are unconstitutional. And I, from what I can tell, he's still kind of like that. Uh, he like wrote a book about it and things like that. Um, whereas Janice, she, and this is back in like the, the seventies and eighties and stuff. This was a time when conformity was still a really big thing in Mormonism. I know it's still kind of depending on like what in, individual subculture you're a part of or what neighborhood you're in. But like, Back then, it was much more intense, but Janice Cox was the sort of person that would like show up to pick up her kids from school wearing like a skin tight leopard print outfit with, you know, giant glasses and things like that. Where, where were they living? Do you remember? Uh, Loma Linda, California. Oh, okay. So, so not in Salt Lake City, Utah. No. Or was, American Fork, Utah. No, 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 no. And uh, there's there's a lot of geography stuff. We're going to skip a lot of it. You know, the stuff that like Dateline in 2020 did, they can they can cover that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, we're, they eventually had, from what I can tell, five kids. Lori's one of their five children. Uh, she wasn't like an unusual kid. You know, uh, it was a, a fairly healthy environment for the most part, with one little exception being that her parents were kind of, I don't want to say absentee parents, but they would regularly uh, go on vacations, adjust themselves and leave the kids behind. They're right? like latchkey kids, kind of a little bit, you know, nothing, nothing that would have made people at the time say, oh, these kids are being neglected. You know, they wouldn't be calling CPS from what I can tell, but it wouldn't be uncommon for the parents to take off and go to Hawaii for like a week and leave their kids uh, money to buy food and stuff. But uh, yeah, like they would do that kind of a thing. Uh, it was kind of a hands-off parenting technique from what we can tell. The other thing, at some point, Janice started getting on her daughters about their weight. Lori was... Like she wasn't like morbidly obese as a kid, but you know, I mean, she was a little bit chunky, you know, normal for your average uh, American kid. But her mom started getting on both her and her sister Stacy about this, and this will have some repercussions later on, and sort of uh, tie back into things a little bit later. Um, she also had a, a brother named Adam, who he's one of the people who from what I can tell is an innocent victim of this. He is uh, somebody who started to notice that Lori eventually will go off the deep end and he tries to right the ship. You know, he at one point tried to organize an intervention with her to try and set her straight. Right. Um, There's another really interesting story about Adam, but that would take us way too far afield. But um, she also had another brother named Alex. Now, Alex, you're going to hear a lot about him. Um, there are things that I could say that aren't really, like we, we can't document to like the biblical standard that this happened. All I can really say is that there are rumors, and I think we can verify that at least he had an unhealthy type and degree of devotion to his sister. Right. Yeah, where yeah. where um, Adam was at one end of the spectrum. Yeah, Alex was at the other. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, you know, um, I, well, I guess in comparison with Alex, uh, anybody seems kind of stable. But yeah, um, yeah, Alex is 
devoted to both Lori and also to his niece in ways that just make people scratch their heads and say, how, how why would anyone be like that? Not just why would anyone do that? Why would anyone have that kind of a disposition right. towards their own sibling? It's just uh, bizarre. Um, yeah. And there's a, there's another sister. Um, she doesn't really factor into the story except for towards the end. She's one of the people that will testify against Lori, but, uh, there's not a lot to say about that. Gotcha. What's up everybody. It's the super sleuth here, letting you know that you can go to shop cultish.com and get all of our exclusive cultish merch. There's the bad theology hurts people shirt. Jerry wears it all the time. I wear it all the time. Sometimes we wear it at the same time without even trying to have that happen on the show. And we're just like, whoa, you're wearing the shirt. I'm wearing the shirt. You could wear the shirt too. Go to shopcultish.com today and get your exclusive cultish merch. Talk to you later, guys. So they, she's growing up and she's kind of a little bit overweight according to her mother's standards. Yeah. And this kind of. But she does. There. She does. Um, probably because of her, her mom's influence. Uh, really buck against that and you know she eventually becomes like a, a beauty contestant and things like that uh, but unfortunately that influence will have uh, a more profound negative impact on her sister Stacy which we'll get into in a minute gotcha okay man okay so continuing on we have right now just the picture of Lori's family and a little yeah. bit of her upbringing kind of a latchkey kid not even really that more yeah, like a nothing <laughs> crazy but like you know, the parents could have been a little bit more active. This was the yeah. 60s and 70s. So yeah. things were a little bit different back then. There's also shag carpeting <laughs> yeah. and, and all kinds of different stuff. So. Yeah, she was growing up. She she was born in, uh, let me see here. It was 1967, I believe. 1973. Oh, 1973. Right, right, right. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yep. 60, 67 was her sister. Yep. Um, yeah, so she was born in 73. And, and so she's grown up in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, that kind of stuff. So uh, in 1990... A young man by the name of Chad Daybell married his wife, Tammy. Now, Chad was in kind of a similar situation in that he, he didn't seem like the sort of person that would end up doing this kind of stuff. I mean, when you look at, say, the, the childhood of uh, somebody like Jim Jones, there were warning signs. Yeah. Huge, blinking, neon warning signs that this dude was headed for trouble. It wasn't like that with Chad. Um, he, he grew up again in, uh, Provo this time, uh, had just lived in an average, uh, kind of Mormon life there. He eventually went to BYU and graduated with a, a degree in journalism. And after he got married, he got, um, a job with Cedar Fort, which is a, a publishing company. It's fairly well known in, in Mormon communities. Uh, and he was kind of high up in that. And so that, that led him to uh, choosing a career in writing books and, and publishing some of his own stuff. And eventually in 2004, Chad and Tammy would actually found their own uh, Spring Creek book company. And that was, uh, that was how he ended up publishing a lot of his own works. Gotcha. And that's kind of how Lori, when we get into that in the future, finds yeah. Chad and kind of gets enamored with some of his uh, theology and ideas. Yeah. All right, so if we can put them on a timeline right next to each other, we have Chad getting married in 1990. Uh, 1992, we have Lori marrying mm -hmm. her first husband and her high school sweetheart, Nelson Yanes. Yeah, we're going to go with Yanes. Yanes. Yeah. And then, okay, so then in 1995, yeah. she divorces Mr. Yanes, and this is kind of like a theme that you see throughout yeah. Lori's This will life. be the first. This is the first. Um, this is, this is the first one. And then in 1995, uh, she, soon after divorcing Mr. Yates, will marry a guy named William. We're going to just say William L. <laughs> I, I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Lagoya. Uh, but Lagoya? Okay. Well, I, I hope I haven't insulted any Lagoyas out there. Yeah. Um, there isn't really anything terribly noteworthy about this marriage, with one exception. This is when Lori has her first son, Colby. Colby throughout this whole story is just this, the most tragic victim, I think of what's happened here. He is one of those ones that is, uh, I can't imagine what he's experiencing right now. I don't think there's anyone in the world that understands it because he has had to see from the outside, like the degradation of his mother 
this is one of the things that makes this story so strange and why it stood out to a lot of people is that Lori Vallow didn't start out being a maniac who would, like a sociopath, want to kill her children. Uh, she During this period, after, uh, after Lori gets a divorce from her second husband, what Colby describes is like you and me versus the world. Yeah. You know, like his mom was his protector and it was like they were best friends and partners and they could do anything together. Yeah. That know? was his stability, his yeah. rock because his father. Yeah. His, his father was no longer in the picture. I don't know what kind of custody arrangements they had, but it, it doesn't sound like, uh, like he was really all that active. Mm-hmm. I, I could be wrong about that, but he doesn't really seem to come into play in later events. So, uh, but yeah, th- this, this provides kind of a contrast for what happens later and, and, why it's so bizarre um but yeah so they that's kind of the way that things were back then they were you know laurie and colby were just trying to get by as a you know single mother and her son all while in another part of the world you know chad and tame and, and tammy are having uh they would eventually have five children and they're starting their careers and everything and all of this is perfectly normal yes but then Something happens that I think is sort of the an indication that things are going off the rails mm. slightly. I mentioned before that Stacy, Lori's older sister, had a problem as a result of, largely as a result of their mom's influence. She got to the point where she even developed uh, what you might call a phobia of sugar. She did not, as an adult, have a healthy relationship with food. And that's something I think she got from her mom. She eventually became a diabetic. And in 1998, she slipped into a diabetic coma and did not ever wake up. That's Lori's sister, Stacy. Yes, Lori's older sister. Uh, and, and imagine the connection she probably has with her sister, knowing that at times of her life, when her parents are gone yeah. for weeks on end, uh, that her sister is probably helping take care of her. It's almost like Possible. a mom, you know? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there was a, something like a six-year age gap. I mean, uh, I think of how, um, you know, I think of your family dynamic where your oldest will take care of the babies to some extent. Yeah. You know, and, and they're going to end up hopefully eventually looking up to her. Um, and that's, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be Lori and, and have your sister die indirectly as a result of something that had influenced you as well. Wow. So she, so she gained, uh, she became diabetic yet. She had a phobia of sugar. Yeah. It was, I forget which type of, of, um, could be a type two diabetes. diabetes. It it probably something like that. What's interesting is typically people get diabetes from like overeating or eating horrible foods. Uh, Well, she, I think went back and forth. I think she would have those, those times where she was, uh, binging or or something along those lines, and it's that imbalance right. that um, caused this problem. And then the phobia of sugar yeah. leads her to a diabetic coma. Yeah, not taking insulin. It's like you you have too much of too much of something, so your body gets used to it, and then suddenly you're not getting that anymore. I'm not a, a medical expert, but that's just not healthy with anything. Yeah, really. You uh, know, yeah, especially sugar. And so the but the key thing here is um, Stacy had a daughter by the name of Melanie. Uh, when Stacy died, Lori began to talk about Melanie as if she was the reincarnation of Stacy. Mm. Not that Stacy just had, uh, or that Melanie had uh, common traits with her mother. It was a stronger kind of language than that, and it was something that stood out in the minds of people that knew her. You know, they didn't say, "Oh, well." this is a bad sign that you're, you're going to go off into a cult at some point. But it was like, this was different from what you would normally say. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Like growing up uh, LDS as well, there's no like <laughs> reincarnation that is orthodox doctrine. No, there's no, them. there's no reincarnation in Mormonism. So the way she maybe gets it is just spirit children and a preexistence or something. And this, this one something spirit like inhabiting that. a body again, I think when we when we dive into the theology of it mm-hmm. uh, later on, after we've kind of go th- gone through um, just the basics of what happened, 
there's there's some reasons for both why reincarnation is not an aspect of Mormon theology and why like how they manage to try and fit this into their own burgeoning kind of thing. Yeah. Um but yeah, just it's not a Mormon thing. Wow. Yeah. And she's already divorced how many times right now? This would be her second, uh, from what I can tell. Yeah. Uh, in 2001, Lori marries for a third time. This time she marries a guy named Joseph Ryan, and together they have uh, a daughter named Tylee. This is a little bit more, um, like there's more to this particular marriage than uh, the, than previous ones. I mean, we don't really know anything about the, the previous husbands. In this case, things get a little bit weird. Uh, there are accusations of abuse of various types, uh, physical abuse, uh, at some point sexual abuse. Again, without, like, I don't think we have, like, the met the, the biblical standard of... Two to three independent lines yeah, of testimony. Yeah, two to three independent lines of testimony to just say definitively who's responsible for what. I've heard enough that I feel like it's credible. There's circumstantial evidence. Yes. There, there are, um, like uh, Joe Ryan's sister came and visited for a while and she had to leave early because she was so sick of her, her, her brother, brother yelling at his kids and like, like roughing them up and stuff like right. that. Right. So we have Lori you know? and Colby and now Tylee and now Tylee. So Colby so, at this age would have been, uh, let's see. I don't know at what, I don't know when he was born though. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So we have Colby. He's a little bit older yeah. and now his sister is born. He's a yeah. big brother. He's and now, brother. and now we have the aspect of abuse coming into the, the household yeah. from Joseph Ryan yeah. Colby then becoming more protective probably over yeah. his sister and even his mother being just a yeah. little bit older of a man. And, uh, just in the midst of that, you know, they eventually do divorce in 2004. There are it, one of the things that makes this kind of tricky is that it's not at all uncommon in custody battles and divorces for somebody to start accusing the other one of being abusive towards the kids. And you have to take that on a case by case basis. Uh, you know, you can't just say, well, the, the person who's being accused is always guilty or the person who's being accused is always innocent. It has to be on a case by case basis. And so we don't have enough to know, but gotcha. it doesn't sound like it was a healthy environment and it doesn't sound like something that any of these kids wanted to grow up. In. Gotcha. So it looks like Colby was born in between like 19, uh, probably around 1996. So at this age, when she's in this relationship, Lori with uh, Joseph Ryan, it'd be anywhere from him being five to about uh, eight to nine years old when the relationship somewhere ended. around there. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So Colby would have been old enough to have some understanding of what was going on. Yeah. 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 Uh, right. But not, not enough to really have the, the kind of perspective that an adult would. Right. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so of, of course they divorced in 2004. And again, you know, it's a single mother and her, trying to raise her two kids. And then they run into a guy named Charles Vallow. Charles Vallow, from what we can tell, is everything that they had initially wanted in a stepdad. Yeah. Um, Charles grew up Catholic. Uh, probably, I, I don't know what, how devoted he was to it, but I do know that he converted to Mormonism uh, in, in his courtship with Lori, that that was an important thing to her. Um, and so, you know, that was, he, he was wanting to be the family man. He wanted to take care of these kids. He wanted to be a good husband. And from all accounts, he was. Um, he he actually previously had played professional baseball. Mm. Like, you you kind of hear the, the audio of uh, when he was talking to the cops later on, and you kind of get this mental picture in your head, and it's just not. That's not what he looks like. You see these pictures online, and he's like this big, beefy guy, you know. Um, and he, he's just, everybody loves him. You know, he, he really, forgive the metaphor, stepped up to the plate uh, and become and became the kind of dad that, like, all these kids had been looking for. Yeah. Um, and for a while, it looked like this story was going to have a happy ending, as long as nothing changed. Right. right. 
So I, I, so I wonder what appealed to him, right? Like she's been divorced three times now. I think, I forget if he had been divorced or if he was a, a widower, but I think he had been married previously. And that was a part of their initial bonding that they both, um, that they they both had this kind of shared experience and and you know it can be hard for somebody who has been married previously to uh find love again yeah i believe you know? he had two children from a previous marriage i think so yeah uh that sounds about right um but yeah he, he he wanted to kind of become this family man and uh move on with his life and it really looks like he did at least for uh for a good while in 2014 the family moved to Kauai, Hawaii. And th- again, things look like they're going really well. This is actually about the time when another major player comes into the story, Joshua J.J. Vallow. Now, the way that this works, uh, it, it gets a little bit complicated. There's a big family tree involved here. Uh, Charles Vallow had a sister named Kay Woodcock, and uh, she was married to a guy, I believe, named Larry. They had a son who, at least for a period of time, was, let's just say, making some unwise decisions. You know, it doesn't seem like he was on the right track. And as a result, he got his girlfriend pregnant. And they decided, you know what, we are not ready to take care of a kid. So they talked with uh, Kay and Larry, and Kay and Larry agreed that they would at least try to raise this kid as their own. Uh, again, a very a very noble thing. You know that's hard for grandparents to do. But um, and they took JJ in, and the way that Larry describes it, it was like he wasn't really sure up until a certain point where he like held JJ, and he was just like, "I love this kid." Um, that that first time that you hold your kid. Yep. You know, and after a while though, there became a problem or a, a problem became apparent to them. The theory, and there's no way to really verify this now, the, the theory is that JJ's biological mother may have been uh, drinking or doing drugs during the pregnancy. Oh, okay. So, yeah, okay. Possibly. We don't really know for sure. Uh, but we do know that at some point, JJ started to exhibit some of the signs of autism. Gotcha. It doesn't sound, it's hard with autism to determine like where on the spectrum they are. Yeah. It doesn't sound like he was so far gone that like, you know, he can't communicate or anything like that. But he did need special care. Yeah. And Kay and Larry are like, we're grandparents. We do not really have the capacity. And they start kind of thinking like, what do we do then? At about that same time, Charles comes for a visit. And he mentions to Kay and Larry, he says, you know, Lori and I are looking to raise a kid by ourselves. Gotcha. And by this point, Colby is probably a teenager, I would think. I'm not sure um, of the exact timeline of his life. Yeah. Uh, But they're like, we want to raise a kid together from the start, right? And it, it was just like a match made in heaven. It was like, this is perfect. Like, we've got this kid that you're absolutely going to love. And everybody is like in love with this kid, right? And they took him in and officially legally adopted him. And so JJ Vallo becomes Lori and Charles' youngest son. Their adopted child. Yeah. Wow. And that's about the same time that they moved to Hawaii. Okay. Gotcha. That's in 2014. So now yes. they're living in paradise, essentially. We've got this uh reun uh this reunified family. We've yeah. got Colby, for- Tylee. Is, is, is um, Charles's two children living with them too at this time? I don't believe so. Okay, so we got Colby, Tylee, and then Charles goes and takes a visit to his sister. Yeah. And they had a grandson, and yeah. he adopts this child into their family. So this yeah. was his great nephew. Yes. Gotcha. Yeah, and so for for the future, we're just going to say JJ was their son. Because in all, yeah. uh, I mean, in reality, when you adopt somebody, that's what happens. Yep. Um, And so, again, at this point, it's like, Things are going really well. You know, Colby and Tylee finally have a stable family. And kids, like, that's the number one thing. You know, and JJ looks like he's got uh, some good parents that are going to raise him up. Everything 
looks like it's going to be fine. Okay. 2017. The family moves back to the U.S. mainland and lives together in Arizona. At this point, friends and family hear that Lori is reading the books of a guy named Chad Daybell. Oh, okay. This is where Chad comes back into the picture. This now. is where everything Intersects. starts to, to collide. Mm. And uh, the way it works is that she, she starts like reading his books and he had a podcast. I forget what the name of it was. There, there are a couple of different podcasts that come together. He, he like does the interviews and, and that kind of stuff. And she's just enraptured by this guy. You know, I, I don't know what level of interest she had in like end times and theology stuff before this. Yeah. But like, I, and I think about, uh, to, to go back, I think what enamored her as well is that Charles, uh, he was kind of like a superficial LDS man. Like he wasn't mm -hmm. really deep into theology or anything like that. It was more like he was LDS for their marriage. And so yeah. Chad, uh, was actually so entrenched, like within LDS yeah. theology that he became his own essential theologian and that, that appealed to her because Charles wasn't the man that was uh, deep into fulfilling yeah. the covenant path in terms think, of an intellectual knowledge. Yeah. In terms of intellectual knowledge. Yeah. I think from what, from what people have said, Charles was, uh, he did actually convert. Yes. You know, it wasn't just a sign on the dotted line kind of situation. He actually was like, you know, uh, teaching Sunday school classes and things like that. Like he was active and involved uh, in the church from the time that he converted. But like you said, like, Chad had this thing where like he had thought about a lot of this and he had a lot of the same um, inclinations as Lori did. Now the, the complicated part and the, the part that gets kind of muddy is who comes up with what at what point? Cause we've already seen that Lori had some concept of reincarnation. Um, but like did Chad already believe that? and they just kind of latched onto each other or was Chad, did Chad hear that and think of this as something that he could use or exploit? I don't think we're ever really going to know that. Right. The only thing that's really still available of his published works that shows what he personally believed is there's one book, I think it was called something like, um, uh, like living on the edge of heaven where he talked about uh, having two near death experiences. Gotcha. And how that, that shaped uh, and how he viewed his life. He said that um, in the second one, uh, the first one was like he was cliff diving or something and, and something went wrong. And the second one was a swimming accident where he was underwater for too long. And in the second one, he says that he like talked to his grandfather about life and stuff. And he received some sort of revelation as to his children's future. I don't know what exactly, but afterwards he said that it was like, um, the, the veil had been torn between him and the afterlife. And so he was always sort of connected to that other world from that point out. Interesting. Yeah. And that's kind of what opens, uh, what opens the door to the rest of everything else? Right. So Lori, Lori's door was essentially opened when her sister died. Finding, yeah, in a, in a way. Finding peace through her niece, uh, thinking in a sense that her niece could be reincarn her reincarnated sister. Uh, and now for 11, I believe it's 11 years. Yeah, 11 years, Lori's been married to Charles. They moved to Arizona. She starts getting interested in some of Chad's podcasts and maybe reading his books, mm -hmm. uh, having correspondence or trying to get correspondence yeah. with him. Uh, Cause it's like Lori's almost like the spiritual leader of her home. So right. it's like Chad is the spiritual leader of his home and he can see it through the, the fruit essentially of his uh, writing and things of that nature. And she's longing for something like that. And then what you're saying is there's a theological interest as well. She's reading yeah. some of these things. She's also interested in uh, things about the end times uh, and he talks about that kind of stuff yeah. as well because it's all mixed with their theology, which we'll get into in the yeah. later episode. But she gets correspondence with him, mm -hmm. and uh, I believe that something else begins to happen. Yeah, there, and we don't have very much insight into what their dynamic was and at what point because a lot of what happened between them was just in personal conversations. Right. It was. Um, yeah, you know, their text messages and things. They they did uh, at some point decide to have separate phones. 
So like Chad had a phone that was just for Lori. Right. And then Lori had a phone that was just for Chad. By the way, married couples, uh, if your spouse is doing that. That's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. Uh, yeah, this is, <laughs> they weren't subtle. And that's the thing that kills me. Just like they, at, at some point, it's obvious. It's so obvious. They're not even trying to hide the affair. What's up, everybody? If you are blessed by this content and you want to support the gospel's proclamation to the cults while equipping the church to combat deception, then come join us and become a cultish all-access member. You will get an ad-free experience and exclusive content like Cultish the Water Cooler, where you hang out with Jeremiah and myself as we go live and interact with all of our members. You'll also get early release of episodes one to two weeks early. On top of all of that, there's also Cultish the Aftermath. It's an after show commentary where we get to say all of the things that they won't let us. On top of that, you get all of the other training on apologiastudios.com. Come be one of us. Head over to thecultishshow.com or follow the link in the show notes and click the join button. Directly support the work of this ministry as the mission is completely funded by you, our listener. Do you think this happened uh, after they had met in person in 2018? Because they, they met at some well, conference yeah. in Utah. Yeah, it was uh, it was in 2018. Yeah, so uh, the first thing that happens is uh, in April 2018, um, Joe Ryan dies. That's one of her. That's, that's her, her third husband, Lori's he, third husband. Yes, yeah, her third husband, the abusive he, one. Yeah, he he dies from a heart attack, and they initially they just kind of wrote that off as being. Um, a heart attack. And then they eventually, they reopened the case after everything else happened. It does look like he actually had a heart attack. Okay. But it was really fortuitous because it meant like he wasn't going to be um, fighting for custody or anything like that. Yeah, because that's right? Tylee's dad. Yeah, that's Tylee's dad. So he would have a, a claim of some sort to her. And suddenly it's over and Lori was not exactly upset about that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then just a few months later in October of 2018, finally Chad and Lori meet in person. Uh, there's a, a conference that uh, took place somewhere in Utah and they finally get a chance to actually talk. Now the conference that we're talking about, I, I don't have the facts and figures, the, the numbers right in front of me, but it doesn't sound like, you know, a Ligonier conference where there's like a thousand people there. They're probably like 30 people. Right? Yeah. So you're going to get some one-on-one -on -one time you're going to get to raise your hand and ask this person a question and there's, you can develop something there. And I think that's exactly what happened. Um, so that's October, 2018. Now, January, 2019, or just a few months later, Charles begins to show some concern about Lori's beliefs. And this is the point at which he calls the police and he talks to them. And this is uh, recorded on body cam. Now, the uh, I don't know how much of the, the full theological package has been delivered to Lori, but we're already at the point now where Charles is saying, my wife is telling me that I've died and that my body is being possessed by a demon named Ned Schneider. Something has happened wow. in a relatively quick period of time. Uh, and this is, it, it's insane. It's wild, but it's so quick. Just a few years ago, like she wouldn't have said anything like that. About this time, according to um, Adam Cox, who, remember, is Lori's other brother, uh, he was saying that he had had a conversation with Lori where she was telling him that she was... Uh, reincarnated and that she had progressed to godhood and had come back and that she couldn't be killed and Adam's like what are you talking about like what is this and sometime around here he gets into contact with Charles and they start talking about having some kind of intervention wow but um Unfortunately, that would not come to fruition. Yeah, let's let's stop real quick. Let's try to find that body cam footage and throw it up here, and let's just listen to a little bit of it. So just for clarification here, here is the first body cam footage. I'm only going to play about a minute and 30 seconds of it just to give context to what yeah. uh, Ryan was talking about. He's outside of a hotel here that Lori was staying at, and uh, he was locked out of the house first by Lori. He went to a hotel to confront his wife. He also had a petition to try to hold her for a mental evaluation. Mm -hmm. So Gilbert police officers captured their interaction with Charles after he failed to locate her. 
at the hotel, and here mm-hmm. it is. So is she in there? I don't know. What's going on? Why is she here and you're not here or are you staying here with her? Long story. She's had kind of a break from me, I mean. She thinks she's your LDS? Yes. She thinks she's married to Morona in the past. This is her you age. think she's what? We're married to Morona at the top of the temple. Angel. Angel, Angel LDS. Angel. They don't she's let me in there. probation, and she knows when the second coming is happening next year, so does the prophet. Okay. He knows that she knows she knows about it. She meets with Morona and Jesus Christ face okay. to face in the temple every day. I've tried to support her as much as I could, but it's gotten really, really bad lately. She's had a break. She says, I'm Nick Schneider. I've taken over Charles's body, and Charles has been killed. I'm going to kill you. You're going to be murdered today or tomorrow. I can, have, I can do it or back with my priest with my power. She's got, she does priesthood blessings. She does. Um, <sighs> so who's so Nick crazy. Schneider? Okay, okay. That's who I have to do. Okay. All right, so we'll stop. We'll stop it there. Uh, There's a lot right there. There is a lot right there. Did you hear that, uh, yeah. everybody? We're again. We're going to get into the theology more in the next uh, episode, but I yeah. want you to have the context of what Charles was going through. He says, "My wife is telling me I'm not Charles. There's mm-hmm. someone named Nick Schneider who's possessed my body, and Nick Schneider has killed Charles, and now I need to die, essentially." And remember, she's been having correspondence now with uh, Chad Daybell for about a year. This is yeah. about a year or a year Roughly. and a half before uh, Charles then comes to police. So he says she's having a mental break. She's not living in reality yeah. anymore. And she's, you know, she's read Charles's books and stuff, but she only meets him in October. Uh, Ch- Chad's books? Yeah, Chad. Uh, yeah. yeah, she she only meets him in October. So right. as far as like a direct uh, interaction, it's only been a few months. Wow. So... I mean, I wish that I had access to like any of his old interviews and stuff. All you can, all you can really find online is like trial transcripts and uh, his awful, awful books. His books are so bad. I mean, they're like, I could go on forever. They can be as bad as you want when you have your own publishing company. Yeah, exactly. Like I, you would wonder like, how did somebody get this done? Like just setting aside bad theology. They're just really stupid. All right. And I know that's not the worst thing he did. But I like to read, and I like to read good things. And it's, I don't want to read any more of Chad Daybell stuff. Right. It's awful. Anyways, uh, so yeah, it's uh, about this time that Lori's beliefs seem to be kind of fully developed into the insanity that will cause everything else to happen. And Charles, uh, Charles is saying, like, Lori has already threatened to kill me. Yeah. Wow. You know, this is... By this point, it's like things have gone too far. And they, as a result of this interaction, will have a psych evaluation done of Lori, which she will pass with with flying colors. Which I I wish I knew a little bit more about that because I wonder how that managed to happen. And Lori is known to be somebody who can be very charming. And so maybe that's got something to do with it. But... Something, it's not just that she's believing things that are weird. Like, there's something wrong with her at this point. Right. That's in February 2019. Yeah. She was actually deemed uh, competent after a mental health intervention. And mm-hmm. Charles Vallow, he filed for divorce February 2019, yeah. saying that he feared for the safety of himself and his children. Yes. And I guess she talked her way through it and charmed the police. I think you can actually yeah. watch parts of that interview on a documentary. I forget exactly. Well, what there's one that she did where, um, they like after her children go missing, the cops come to her house and they're like, what's all this about? And she just totally has these cops in the palm of her hand. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, I don't know if that's the one you were thinking of, but it like, yeah, it just shows like how deceitful she can be. Yeah. I believe that in, in the documentary that I watched, that it could it could have been that interview, but mm-hmm. I believe they actually had footage from the the first initial interview after he uh, talked to it the might. police and filed for the divorce. But I, I remember just them talking about essentially that she was a charmer, she was a, mm-hmm. a beauty queen. Oh yeah, at one point, so she knew how to talk right mm-hmm. and get her way out of things. Oh yeah, and I believe she even brought her daughter with her to the interview, uh, Tylee, to give mm-hmm. some type of sway because she didn't. 
not only just manipulate the police, she also yeah. manipulated her children at this time. Yeah. She manipulated Colby and she also manipulated Tylee. Especially Tylee because Tylee had... Uh, at this point, uh, a devotion to her mom. Like she wanted to be just like her mom. She wanted her mom's approval so, so bad. And that, I think, explains a good bit of what happens next. Right. And before we go on, uh, I believe in the documentary as well that her son, he consistently tried to get her to see things clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, part of their relationship got destroyed uh, with Colby. Uh, he claims in the interviews that he was now a Christian. He had come to Christ. I think through meeting his girlfriend. Maybe. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah. And uh, he was always having phone conversations with her, trying to plead with her to uh, know who Jesus is. And I know there's controversy with Colby now today. Yeah. I'm not going to get into any no. of that type of stuff, but it just shows you the dy dynamic of the relationship that he would have had at his, with his mother during the time she started having an, an emotional break. And I, and I meant to say actually that she was manipulating JJ, not Colby at the time. Yeah. She's manip manipulating Tylee and JJ, I believe Colby at this time is doing his own thing, trying yeah, to reach and plead out of with, the house. Yeah, he's trying to he's, plead with his mother to regain some form of sanity because he is the one that she actually stays in consistent contact with almost throughout the whole time because it's her son. And during these phone conversations, he's tr constantly trying to to plead with her yeah. to regain some mental yeah, He's sanity. trying to bring her back. He's, tr he's trying to bring her back. So we have a marriage in shambles right now with mm. Charles and Lori. Uh, I can only imagine what custody looks like with yeah. JJ and Tylee. Uh, meanwhile, I believe Charles isn't living at home anymore. He's yeah. allowing Lori to stay there. And Lori brings her brother into the picture. You said something yes. about Adam, her her first brother, not Alex. But um, yeah. talk about that real quick. Yeah, Adam. Uh, well, just to, as far as the stuff that pertains to what's going on yeah. here. he He'd had... Um, by this point, he had conversations with Lori that were like, uh, like the, this woman has gone completely insane. What do we do about this? And I think that's kind of indicative of how the rest of the family was feeling. Now, what he's talked about in, in interviews past is that she had kind of destroyed like that part of the family too, because in order for everything to uh, follow the way that it does, there has to be a lot of lying. And so she starts telling people, oh, well, you know, the kids are over here, the kids are over there. And it leaves everybody else in the family thinking, well, do I believe her or do I not? And if I don't believe her, well, then what does that mean? You know, if Lori doesn't know where the kids are, then what happened to the kids? And it makes you sort of feel bad for thinking that your own sister could do something, something bad to her own kids, but like you're also realizing that things don't make sense. And that kind of stuff was splitting open uh, the rest of the family. Um, as far as Adam goes, he, he tried, tried to like talk to his mom and say like, Hey, Lori's saying some weird stuff. And his mom was like, well, she didn't say anything like that to me. Um, Adam tried to set something up with Charles and just, get an intervention going. I don't know if he tried that before the uh, the divorce or if it was afterward, but I, I do know that because of what happens in July, they never get a chance to actually do that. Yeah, and what exactly happened in July? And okay. let's let's get into that right now. All right, so here's where uh, where national attention starts to be, be drawn into this. On July 11th, 2019, Charles Vallow was shot dead by Alex Cox at Lori's home in Chandler, Arizona. The claim made by Alex and Lori and Tylee is that Charles came to Lori's house looking to pick up the kids as part of their custody agreement. There was some sort of altercation between him and Alex. Um, at some point, Tylee gets scared and grabs a baseball bat and comes downstairs and somehow Charles gets the baseball bat out of her hands, um, attacks Alex and hits him in the back of the head. And Alex just happens to have, uh, a, I think it was a revolver on him and he shoots 
Charles. He supposedly is the revolver was near the suitcase in the bedroom and he ran into the bedroom and grabbed yeah. the fire. He didn't have it on like on his body. He had yeah. it nearby because mm-hmm. that would have been suspicious, I guess. Um, after this happens, um, Lori, I don't, I don't know if Lori was supposed to be at the scene at the time, but she takes uh, JJ to school, which is one of the first signs that I think should have been kind of an alarm to everybody that something weird was happening here. Because the, the police who arrive on scene don't know any of the stuff that we've just brought in. Um, they, they don't know that she's got these weird spiritual beliefs or anything like that. They just know uh, an ex-husband has been killed in the home of his wife. And, well, you know, these kinds of situations can be very volatile. It's kind of understandable. And remember, the testimony that we have about what happened comes from Tylee. Mm-hmm. It comes from uh, Alex. From Alex and, and from Lori. And parts parts of it coming from Lori. So if you want, you can actually go and you can look on YouTube and find body cam footage of the conversations that uh, Lori and Tylee were giving to the police officers about what happened and uh, why Alex shot Charles Vallow. Uh, You can weigh that for yourself. I believe that the courts already weighed in on parts of their opinion of the situation. But continuing on, we have now Charles Vallow, right? Married to this woman for about... 11, 12 years. Somewhere in there. Uh, it seems like he was the one that she was always waiting for to rescue their family, to take them from the pit. But something happens where she falls in love with a man through his writings and through his theology, ends up believing some insane things about the afterlife, uh, about even herself oh. having a direct connection with God. And her brother as well gets roped into this. And her brother ends up killing Charles. Yeah. And and that's that's the reality. So she, we have one dead husband before, yes. Joseph Ryan, uh, which they've said died, she, he died of natural causes. Probably. Just, trying to, just trying to paint yeah. a picture here. And then yeah. we have now uh, Charles Vallow shot. Yeah. Multiple times by her brother, Alex. And then what happens? Well, already this is sort of attracting some attention because there are aspects of what happened that don't really make a whole lot of sense. And I, you know, it's already, it's been done to death, but I'll just point out that um, you can see in the, in the videos that Alex has like a bandage on the back of his head. Mm -hmm. And he says that um, uh, the Charles hit him with a baseball bat. Charles Vallow was a big guy. He's bigger than me. And I'm a big guy. Uh, And he used to play baseball. And I'm thinking, if this dude swings a bat and hits you in the head, you're not going to get a little scratch on the back. You're not going to be okay. Yeah, you're going to be out for the count. Yeah, like that's that's a big thing. Also, it's discovered later that like Alex never stayed the night at Lori's house except for this one time. And, you know, he waited 43 minutes to call the police. It's just a bunch of stuff that just sounded weird to people. And, uh, you know, her, her reaction when they interview her is kind of strange. Because the thing is, if you plan a murder ahead of time, you mentally get used to the idea that this person is going to die. So it's hard for you to fake shock. Uh, you, you can't really fake the surprise because it's not a surprise to you. You knew this was going to happen and you're used to the idea of this person not being alive anymore. And I think that's the case with uh, everybody that was interviewed, including Tylee. But their stories were all the same. Right. And uh, I think this will play into the fates of various people later on in the story. Uh, But then in uh, September of 2019, Lori, who now has uh, custody of her two youngest children, moves to Rexburg, Idaho, under kind of strange circumstances. And that's where Chad Daybell was living at the time. It was strange because she didn't go out and say to everybody, hey, I'm going to Rexburg, Idaho. Like Colby had to track her down. Um, they, why not be open about this? And unfortunately, very soon thereafter, the problem gets much, much bigger because that's when uh, on the 8th of September 2019, uh, Tylee and JJ and Alex and Lori go to uh, Yellowstone National Park where they finally have their, their final uh, family outing and get together and this one haunting 
picture of of the kids together and after that tyler goes missing wow and i th- I, th- I think right here is the the sad a sad place to stop the episode yeah but we're gonna stop the episode here and then we're gonna get into the end of the life lives of yeah. uh, jj and, and tyler and then we're gonna go into the theological implications yeah, what like, ex- what is it that happened here what from a th- the spiritual perspective yeah let's let's untangle this timeline yeah. uh through the lens of understanding their theology yeah. and critiquing these things through the biblical worldview because bad theology hurts people. And again, how could all of this have been prevented? How, how could all of this have been prevented? And again, we know that justice will occur cosmic justice uh, by the God who will make all things right in the end for the terrible things that mm-hmm. occurred to JJ and Tylee and even Charles. Yeah. Uh, in my opinion, and a whole bunch of other innocent people who have been, negatively affected by this absolutely so uh stick with us while we talk about this in the second part coming up right after this we hope you enjoyed this episode